Ah, the sweet soul stylings of Reverend Al Green. When I was a student at Syracuse University, somehow or other, I landed a part-time gig as a radio DJ at some AM oldie station, and we played a lot of Al Green. And by the way, when I say DJ, I don't mean the cool kind of DJ like DJ Miles over here. I mean more of that sort of lame, hey, everybody, we'll take the fifth caller right now. You'll win a pair of tickets to see the Bee Gees, that, that type of AM DJ. That was my part-time job in college. I think I got paid $7 an hour. So I'm being honest, slightly overpaid for the talent I brought. But uh, I did get to see the Bee Gees live, so I had that going for me. Let me start with a very simple thought. This is a thought that we should probably have every single day, all of us who are in the service business, but I bet most of us rarely think about it. Imagine how much money is at stake based on the success of your overall service operation. For most companies, that is millions of dollars. Millions of dollars at stake, your strategic and financial success so dependent on the success of your entire service operation. And when you think about it, the success of your service operation is dependent on two people, and you are neither one of those people. Think about it that way. One customer having one interaction with one service rep, that is it. There is nothing else more than that. It's that one interaction times however many interactions your company does in the course of the year, which might be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions. Millions of one-on-one -on -one interactions. And here's the thing. You don't get to control who your customers are, but you have absolute control over who that one person who's interacting with that one customer is. So today, we're going to talk about how you can find the best people and how you can identify the people who are the best at creating the best one-on-one -on -one experience with your customers based on everything that we've been learning about the critical value of providing low-effort service to customers. So it's been just extraordinary over the course of the past couple of years. Matt Dixon, who many of you have met, he was here last year. Myself, our friend Nick Toman, we've been traveling around the world sharing the story of the effortless experience and just so humbled to hear how many people have been profoundly impacted by the research and what we've been learning. I know most people are familiar with it and we get a great introduction there about the whole idea that the thing we really want to try to optimize toward in a service interaction and particularly now specifically we're speaking about this kind of service interactions where a customer has a problem or an issue that they need to resolve. Not the everyday quotidian kind of friendly, how you doing, how may I help you kind of basic service, but the kinds of issues that are profound enough for a customer to have to reach out to us and solve a problem. Problem resolution. What are we optimizing for? What are we measuring? How do you know whether or not that interaction between those two people were successful? Well, when you measure customer satisfaction by asking the customer, were you satisfied with this experience? That seems like a good thing to ask, and we certainly want customers to be satisfied, but what we've learned is, and if you look at the subtitle of the book there, Conquering the New Battleground for Customer Loyalty. When it comes to trying to understand and predict a customer's future loyalty, again, what we've learned is asking the satisfaction question isn't very predictive of what customers are going to do in the future. Doesn't mean we don't want people to be satisfied, of course we do, it's just that asking them whether or not they were satisfied doesn't predict what they're going to do in the future. The NPS question is a really good question to ask customers about the totality of their overall experience in every touch point and every element of every interaction they've ever had with your company. But when you ask a customer who just had a problem or an issue that they had to resolve, how likely are you to recommend our company? Their answer to the NPS question, again, isn't very predictive of what they're going to do in the future. It's more predictive than asking the CSAT question, but it's not as predictive as we'd like, which is why in the research that we've done at CEB, we discovered, and this was a surprise when we first did, that when you ask customers this single question, their response to that question is more predictive than anything else you could ask them in the moment about their future loyalty, and that question is, did the company make it easy for me to resolve my issue? And so that whole idea of thinking about a low effort service interaction is not just the right thing to do, but even the right thing to measure has had a huge impact on the success of so many companies all around the world. Matt Dixon and I did a book signing 
in Las Vegas just a couple of months ago, and we were just absolutely knocked out by the number of people. I counted specifically eight people who came up to me personally and said exactly the same thing, and that is, the ideas that you guys have discovered through the research and the whole idea of the effortless experience has changed the way we do business at our company, and we like the new way a lot better. It's more fun, it's more satisfying to us, and we're seeing real success with our customers. So everything that I'm gonna share with you today starts with the story of the effortless experience, but it builds on from there because the latest research we've been doing is all about talent. It's all about your people. Who is that one person? What are they all about? Where are they coming from as a person? Their personality, their emotions, their preferred interactive style, the style and profile of how they interact with customers has a huge impact on your success. So we've been asking companies around the world, what exactly are you doing to reduce customer effort? And I suppose it makes sense that the vast majority of what companies are doing are based largely on system and process improvements. So about 72.8% of what companies are doing are things like reducing unnecessary processes, trying to fix their technological infrastructure, trying to create more self-service options for customers, and that all makes sense. 27.2% is based on people-related investments, hiring, training, coaching, that kind of thing. And again, it seems like the right approach because in today's world, it's a much more technological world. So many more issues are being handled in self-service. There's so much more that customers expect from us in terms of simple processes and a lot more options for them to be able to solve their own problems online or through mobile apps. It seems like the right approach if you believe that most of what effort is all about is about what customers have to do. And the majority of companies around the world that are trying to work on reducing their effort are primarily fixing things customers have to do, which is kind of like assuming that effort is all about what customers have to do, how many things they have to do, and how hard it is to do those things. So thinking about effort more like exertion, the things customers have to do. And again, that makes total sense. Which is why we were surprised to find that as we dug deeper into exactly how customers perceive effort, it doesn't look like this because customers perceive effort very differently. Only about one third of how customers experience effort has to do with what they have to do. The other two thirds, 65.4%, is really how did the whole thing feel? So think about how many people, even just in the course of today, have talked to you about emotions and those sort of intangible elements of the emotional connection that customers have with service providers, with companies, and with the whole experience. So the whole feel side of effort is profoundly impactful and makes a huge difference. And again, remember, how customers experience effort is the perfect predictor of their future loyalty. And so working on the feel side of effort is a critical and important step that a lot of companies are really just starting to get a handle on. So ironically, in today's world, which is driven so much by technology, the technological expectations of customers, the technological capabilities of companies, it's amazing to think your people matter more than ever. You know, think about the CFO of your company. They're probably largely thinking about how much money your company is spending on infrastructure and technology. People are sometimes the forgotten part of the equation, and yet people are more critically important than ever, and particularly this person. This person who is doing this job called frontline rep. This person and what they do every day looks more or less the same as it's always looked. It's a person with a headset on, they're in a call center. And in the old days, just sort of being nice and friendly and personable, how might I help you, being sort of a comfortable, empathetic personality, that was more than sufficient to handle the challenges of yesterday's world. But even though in today's world, the job still looks the same, it's still a person in a headset, you know, working in a call center, maybe they have two screens now instead of one, maybe they have a little bit more technological whiz-bangery in front of them, but it still looks like essentially the same job. But if you think about it, the pressures, the responsibility, the complexity of this job is drastically different in just the last 10 years. Think about it this way. 
By the time a customer even calls in to a call center, think about what they've already gone through. The vast majority of customers in today's world, their first reaction when they know they have a problem or an issue they need to resolve is to go online, either through a mobile app, through their laptop, through a desktop computer, for those people who still have those things. But the point is, the predominant tendency of customers is to try to solve the problem themselves. And in a lot of situations, you can. But what about the situations where you can't? The vast majority of times that customers have to pick up the phone and call a live rep, they did not want to make that call. And therefore, the job of being a rep, the person who's on the other end of the line with customers who have already been through some number of misadventures to get to the point where they make a phone call in the first place, customers who have higher expectations, customers who have greater demands, the job is just a lot more complex. It's a harder job, problems are harder, customers have higher expectations, it's a very different job. We more or less call it the same thing, frontline rep, maybe your company uses cooler terms like customer care advocate, or maybe you've changed the terminology, but the job itself looks almost exactly the same as it looked 10 years ago. But the world is very different. Customers are very different. Expectations are very different. The job itself is considerably harder. So ask yourself this question. Have you truly rethought your frontline talent strategy? Are you really hiring remarkably different people than you would have hired before? Are you training them in significantly different ways than you have? Are you incenting them differently? Have you changed the whole dynamic of your call center? And frankly, most companies have said, kind of not. I mean, we've done some things around the edges, tried to modernize a few things, tried to contemporize the overall job. But more or less, working in a call center today looks more or less like working in a call center 10 or 15 years ago. And so when you start to think about it at that level, we're really not positioning our frontline people for success, are we? We're kind of throwing the same old kinds of people and training them in the same old kinds of ways into a much tougher, much more demanding, much more emotional world. Problems or issues that require live contact are different, more complex, more emotionally charged, and ultimately and unfortunately, what we've turned our call centers into is the factory of sadness. We can laugh, it's just us, we all get it, we all feel this, but it is really a shame to think that the same old people are being thrown into a much different situation that they may not really be fully prepared for. So our thought is, who should we really be hiring in today's world? What kind of rep meets the needs of today's customers? And when we say today's customers, well, let me ask you this question. What is this thing that I'm holding in my hand right here? Uh, it's an Apple. It's an iPhone, right? It's the, last, it's the one with the last headphone jack on it. It's, it's the old one, right? Well, sure, this is an iPhone. But do you ever think about this? You know what this thing really is? This, I'm sorry? A lifeline, yeah, it's definitely a lifeline. This is a me machine, right? This is the machine that allows me and you and each of us individually to create a world that's all about us. You know, what is the, the music part of your iPhone? It's a radio station that plays all of your favorite tunes. You don't need some $7 an hour DJ anymore. You can play your own songs. Facebook is nothing more than the newspaper of stuff that's happening about people you care about. The entire world of what you want, of what you like, of what you expect, of what you demand is all right here in the palm of your hand. So customers are very different today. They have higher expectations. They're more me-centric. They get more emotionally frustrated when there's a problem or an issue that requires a phone call to resolve. It's a different world and customers are really different. So we've been asking, what specific kind of rep is best for providing low effort service to customers in today's world? Now we've asked supervisors, managers, leaders around the world, what's the one word you would use to describe a great call center rep? And look at this word cloud, look at all these different words. 
And even when we try to ask them, what's the one word that would best describe the best service people you have? They could only come up with two words, service oriented. Now think about it this way. If you're a recruiter or a hiring manager and we said to you, go out and find people who are service oriented, that sounds great, right? But, but what does that mean exactly? What exactly am I looking for? How would I know if somebody's service oriented? Somebody said, that's like if you work for a restaurant chain and you were hiring a bunch of different chefs, it'd be like, go out and find people who are food oriented. Like, okay, I get it, that's, that's what we want, but what does that look like? How am I supposed to find that? Other terms that come up, good communicator, that's great. A Little bit hard to assess. High EQ, who doesn't want that? A good listener. Here's another one that comes up all the time, empathetic. You know, if you've ever worked in a contact center operation, and certainly you know lots of people who have, when you ask them, you know, what's great about your best people? What are the qualities that they have that make them excellent at their job? And where this is an understood terminology, what makes people great at creating low effort service for customers? What we hear over and over again is, I know it when I see it, but it's kind of hard to put into words. So that's where the analysis that we've been doing at CEB comes in, because over the course of the past couple of years, we now have two weapons that are available to us that were never available before. Two sets of data that when you combine them create some significant results and even some big surprises. So first of all, the science of talent analytics has really exploded over the last couple of years. That's why we're so excited to know the Mattersight team and to be part of Call to Loyalty. Think about the extraordinary work that they're doing when it comes to personality analysis and understanding what's happening inside the human brain of call center reps and customers. Being able to understand people at a greater level of analysis has never been available to us before. And now, although it's still kind of nascent at some levels, we're beginning to understand a lot more and being able to analyze a lot more about what makes people who they are. So talent analysis combined with, now that we've been working with companies to help them measure effort and creating effortless experience dashboards for them and working with companies to help them determine where the high effort scenarios are occurring within their everyday world, we now have about a six year database of low effort performance at companies. And we can even help companies identify who are your best low effort reps. Who are they? What exactly are they doing differently? What is it about their style, their profile, their way of interacting with customers that makes them great at being able to do a low effort experience time after time after time, one customer at a time. So when you combine the science of talent analytics and the science of what we've been learning about low effort service, what we've discovered is that you can learn things by talking to people that we didn't know before. We did an analysis of over 1,000 job seekers and over 1,400 contact center reps. We learned more about their preferred interactive style, to some degree their personality, the way they are as people. And what you're looking at here is a total test pool of 2,462 people, and that sounds like a big random mess of a lot of people. I mean, we like to think of ourselves as individuals. We like to think of ourselves as unique, right? We're all like fingerprints and snowflakes. No two of us are exactly alike. But rather than looking at all of these people, the people you currently have employed, the people who are available to potentially hire, instead of looking at them as a bunch of random people who are all uniquely individual, what we've discovered is in the contact center world, in the customer service world, the world divides up very neatly into seven profiles. Seven interactive styles, somewhat based on personality, somewhat based on communication style, somewhat based on the, the, the effectiveness and the procedures that they use to interact with customers. Seven unique styles, and almost everybody fits into one of these seven. Now that being said, almost none of us is exactly one and only one type. But if you think about, I don't know, when you went to college, what was your major? You know, you studied a lot of different things. You took 120 credit hours probably of various courses, but there was one thing that was kind of your major, and that is kind of the way these profiles work. 
Very few people are 100% exclusively just one of these seven profiles, but almost everybody tends to gravitate toward one of these seven. So I'm going to show you the seven, and as I'm doing that, be thinking to yourself, which type do you think is best at providing low effort service when customers have a problem or an issue that they need to reach out to the company to resolve? And again, amidst the backdrop of today's more complex, more me-centric, more demanding customers. Each of these profiles has a number of positive traits, and there's also some limitations, you know, just like all of us, nobody's exactly perfect. And by the way, we're not suggesting for a moment that any of these different profiles makes a person a bad person or even a bad employee. They're all potentially wonderful people and wonderful employees, but again, here specifically, we're looking for the outcome of being able to provide great low effort service to customers who have a problem or an issue. So here come the seven. I'll give you a brief overview of each of them. And the first one is the hard worker. And these are people who, <laughs> these are people who work hard. These are hard workers. These are the kinds of people who are really good at process and procedure. They churn through the call queue really quickly. They're great at doing their post-call work. They would say things, if you were doing a profile analysis, of things like, I take care to follow rules and procedures. I like working with numbers. I persist until the job is done to meet deadlines. The whole numbers thing is probably less about math skills, but more about people who like working in the black and white world where one thing is right and one thing is wrong. In today's world, you've got a lot of issues that are a little bit more gray. Sometimes there isn't always a right answer to every complex problem, so the limitation for hard workers is they tend to be a little bit more rigid, but man, they are efficient and they get the job done. So that's one of the seven profile types. Here's another one, the empathizer, the warm people people. These are wonderful people. They're people who need people, and aren't they the luckiest people in the world if you think about it? We know these types. I like spending time helping other people with their problems. I try to understand motives and behavior. They're great listeners. Anybody ever heard that story? It's a legendary story about some Zappos rep who had like a seven hour phone call with some customer. You know that story? It's sort of taken on almost an apocryphal kind of quality to it. That rep had to be an empathizer. That person is a great listener and they're willing to sort of endure people. So the warm human type. Here's a completely different profile, the innovator. This is more like the restless mind, the kind of person who's always trying to figure out some better way to do stuff. I prefer variety. I don't like doing the same thing over and over again. I behave differently depending on the situation or the person. I like generating new ideas. Somebody said, if you're looking for this person in the call center, go to their cube because their headphones on the desk and they're in the supervisor's office describing the 10 things that we ought to fix to get better. That's the innovator. Here's the accommodator. The accommodator's kind of like a negotiator, the kind of let's meet you halfway kind of person who's really good at kind of brokering deals between customers and the company. I believe what others say. I enjoy others' companies. I involve others in decision making. This is the kind of person who makes the one-time exception every time, the accommodator, always looking to find some way to balance the needs of the company and the customer. And again, all these profiles have their advantages. They can all be wonderful people. The question is, who do we really want to hire? The controller is a person you can recognize immediately because they tend to be pretty loud. These are really verbal people, very outspoken, talkative. I make my strengths known. I freely express opinions. When we say controller, we don't mean like a control freak per se, but somebody who in a social situation is more likely to be kind of the dominant personality who takes control over situations where no one else is in the lead. The next type is the competitor. We all know people like this. They tend to be great at sales. I like to compete against others and win. I'm a fast decision maker. I like to change other people's views. Here's the analogy. If you have a contest next month to see who will have the shortest average handle time, this person will win. If the month after that you say, we're gonna have a contest to see who has the longest handle time, this person also wins. They don't care, they'll do whatever it takes to be the winner in whatever the category is. So, for things like upsell, they could be really good. 
One slight drawback, they tend to view their coworkers more as people I need to defeat rather than being teammates. And finally, here's the rock. This is the unfazed, undaunted, unflappable person. They're like water off a duck's back. I tend to feel relaxed. I expect things to turn out well. I'm difficult to offend. These people could handle seven irate phone calls in a row, and nothing ever gets to them. Remember that old toy, the Weeble? Remember Weebles? Who remembers the slogan, Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. That's who the rock is. That you can punch them over and over again, and they just come back up like one of those inflatable clowns. You know? So like the rock is the steady personality who can handle all kinds of abuse and rebound and come back for more. So as you look at these terms, like think already about some of the different profile names you've heard and some of the different personality categories. As you look at what we've been learning and the names that we've assigned here, you know, it's very similar to what Matterside has been learning. Some of the terminology may feel a little bit different, but I think we, and if you think about what Maxi was sharing with different customer profiles, we're all kind of learning the same thing. There are distinct characteristics that individual people have that make them unique. And when you can further the science and understanding of talent analytics, there's some extraordinary things you can learn. So again, uniquely the question here is, which of these seven profiles is best at providing low effort service to customers? And I'm gonna show you the stack rankings in three different ways. First of all, I'm gonna show you who companies are currently hiring. Then I'm gonna show you, based on a poll of executives we did, who do companies think they'd like to hire for openings in their contact center, and then ultimately, who's best at low effort service. So see if you're surprised, or if you would have known that currently in seat, the highest percentage by far are empathizers. 32% of people who are working in contact centers today fit the general profile of being that warm, empathetic personality. And frankly, isn't that what we've always asked our recruiters to find? Find people who are service oriented, who have high, e, high, high EQ, who are empathetic. So it only seems right that empathizers are the more dominant profile in today's world. Hard workers come in second. You know, Call centers need to be efficient, so it makes sense that you'd hire a lot of hard workers, and then you can work on down the rest of the list. Here's where it starts to get more interesting. We surveyed over 100 executives of major service operations all around the world in different industries and asked them, if you have openings in your call center, who would you like to hire? Now, we didn't just show them the names. We showed them the full extent of the profiles. And take a look at this. Who do they prefer to hire? It's the empathizer, again, by an even wider margin, more than two and a half times higher than any of the other profiles. What does this tell you? What it says is, when we have openings, we'd like to try to find another person to sit in that same seat who's a lot like the person who sat in that seat previously. And now think about how different the job is how different the world is, how different customers are. Can you see where we're going with this? That's kind of like trading like for like. That's like saying, my old car was a 2005 Chevy Cavalier, and geez, unfortunately it has 150,000 miles, so I gotta get a new car. Why don't I get a 2005 Chevy Cavalier? Like, why don't I replace what I had with exactly what I wanna have in the future? It really doesn't make sense when you recognize how different the job is, how different customers are, and how different the world is. Which is why it came as a huge surprise when you look down the list, the innovator is next, the rock, the hard worker, accommodator, competitor, all the way down to the bottom, only 2% of executives said, I prefer to hire controllers, which is why we were shocked to see that by far, the rep profile type that is the best at providing low effort service is the controller. That verbally confident, large and in charge, bit of a know-it-all, bit of a loud mouth, kind of verbally confident person. Surprised a little bit? We definitely were. All I'm showing you so far is just data. So when we first looked at the numbers, 
we spend a lot more time thinking about how could this be true? How could this be the profile of people who are best at doing the thing that we know we need more people to be able to do? Let me show you what the numbers look like, because again, thinking about the preponderance of what we've hired in the past and what we would expect to hire are people who are empathizers. And when you look at their performance in being able to provide a low effort experience for customers, empathizers are slightly below the overall average. Empathizers average at the 48th percentile of performance. But when you look at people who fit the profile of the controller, they start at the 60th percentile level, or the average is the 60th, just based on their own style, the way they like to act, the way they think, the way they interact, just that, taking everything else out of the equation, training, ability to do the technology involved in the job, anything else that you do in terms of coaching or positioning them for success, just by hiring people who fit this basic profile type, you're already well ahead of the performance curve and through the work that we've done at CEB, we've put together interview guides, we've put together a lot more supporting information that helps you hire not just any controller, but the best of the controllers. And as you go to the right of the bell curve, the top 50% of controllers are at the 70th, 80th, 90th percentile of overall low effort performance, just based on this one set of considerations. Now, as you're just trying to get your mind around this and why these people are so much better at providing low effort service, Let's personalize this to some extent, okay? So for just a minute, take yourself out of your professional responsibility being a leader in the service operation at your company or whatever your specific job is. For just a minute, let's just pretend that you're a normal person, okay? So just make believe you're a real person just for a minute. When you need help, when you've got some kind of a problem, when you go to a website and can't solve your problem, then finally have to pick up the phone and call, who would you really rather deal with? What makes you feel confident and relaxed? And what comes across to you as a low effort kind of experience? Is it really a person who's warm, friendly, caring, professional, the hallmarks of being an empathizer? And by the way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being warm, friendly, caring, and professional, not at any level. But when you've got a problem, and now you're agitated, and you tried to solve it yourself, and you couldn't, and now you have to wait on hold, and you finally talk to a rep, don't you really want somebody who takes control and owns the problem and the solution? Think about how that feels to you. Think about how, through everything that you've already been through to get to the point where you finally talk to a live person, doesn't it feel great? when you know that that person knows what they're doing, gets your problem, owns your problem, and is gonna solve your problem. That's really what low effort service feels like, isn't it? And so when you think about the difference between empathizers and controllers, and again, there's nothing wrong with empathizing with people, but the profile of the empathizer tends to be focused on providing a great experience. And in general, in the lifetime of every touch point you have with a company, great experiences really matter. But at that exact moment where you get a problem or an issue, you get to call up the company, you didn't want to have to call and you get a problem, you try to resolve it online, and you've been through this whole hassle, what you really want is a great outcome. What you really want is just solve the damn problem. Make the pain go away. It's 10 p.m., I'm sweating in my apartment, I have no electricity, just turn the electricity on. The experience is secondary. At the moment of some problem or issue, you just want the outcome. So controllers are the kinds of people who take control, the kinds of people who give customers the confidence that they know what's happening, the kinds of people who really impact the experience of a low effort experience, if you think about it that way the people who are large and in charge. Let me tell you, before I worked for CEB, I've been with CEB for the last 10 years, but prior to that, I worked in the airline business. And I remember doing an analysis of this one agent who we had. This lady, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, she was, she was a little bit nuts. She was a little bit of a weird personality, but she was so great with customers. She wasn't even, frankly, a great employee because she would show up late some days and or other downstream issues involved with her daily employment, but she was amazing with customers. 
And I remember listening to her talk to customers on a disastrous day. Let me ask you, have you ever been in a situation where a call queue is more than an hour long? Yeah. Now that's absurd in some businesses, but in the airline business, you know, think about days of massive weather catastrophes, hundreds of flights canceled. You know, the call queue could easily be more than an hour, and there's nothing that you could do to staff up for something that's generally unexpected and, you know, massively wipes out a whole airline operation. Here's how this, well, let me first of all tell you, the typical responses of call center operators or, or frontline agents in a one-hour queue situation would either be to apologize, I'm terribly sorry you had to wait for an hour, or to try to explain the problem away to customers. Well, sir, certainly you realize there's thousands of other customers affected in the same way, and we're answering the calls as fast as we can take them. Like, the apology or the explanation? This one woman, though, who I didn't have a name for it at the time, this woman was the classic controller. Here's what she would say to people. Hey, I can see you've been on hold for more than an hour. I bet that sucked. <laughs> but luckily, you got me, and I'm the best person here. So let's work together and solve your problem. Like, that's, that's all it took. You can't give that customer that hour back. But giving them the confidence that you're going to take control of their situation, own their problem and their solution, that is what low effort feels like to customers when they have a problem or an issue that they need to solve. So we would never say that empathy is the wrong thing for a person to project. But now what we've discovered is there's a new empathy. The old empathy used to be friendly, warm, human, repeat the customer's name three times. The new empathy is let me solve your problem in the fastest and easiest way. And I know how to do that because I'm confident, I get what your problem is, I've helped lots of other people who have that same problem, let me grab you by the wrist and pull you to safety. You know, like, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator 2, come with me if you want to live. I'm gonna just drag you now to the other side of the resolution of your problem and it's gonna be effortless because I know what I'm doing and I'm here to be on your side. So once we learned all this science about these controller people, these people who fit this profile of being a controller, we talked to them. We found a number of people at different companies all around the world who were both high performers at their company and also fit the profile of being a controller. And we asked them, how do you describe the difference between you and your colleagues when it comes to handling customer issues? And they all ended up saying more or less the same things. They said things like, I understand what people actually need so they get results quickly. My personal satisfaction as an employee of this company, working as a call center rep, I love it when I can take control of somebody's problem and solve it really quickly. It's about taking the lead to help customers figure out what they need. A lot of them said, sometimes customers don't even really know what they need. They might be able to describe the problem, but they don't really know what they need. That's where I come in. I'm the inside expert. I'm the guy that knows all the shortcuts and the tips and the tricks and the life hacks. I'm the one who can guide them to resolution. I like to guide people and take control to ensure everything is going well. We did a number of qualitative interviews with people who fit this profile of being controllers. They came from very different backgrounds, some of them much older, some of them much younger. Every imaginable stereotype, race, profile, they didn't look the same, some were male, some were female, some had a tremendous amount of education, some didn't even graduate high school, some had years of experience in customer service, some were brand new to customer experience, to customer service. There was nothing about them on their surface that looked the same. But the way they responded and their attitude about serving customers was profoundly similar. And one of the questions we asked each of them was what we call the Disney World question. It's funny how Disney World has come up a number of times today. Chip was talking about the Magic Kingdom before, but have you ever been in this situation? You are standing at the front entrance of Main Street, USA with your entire extended family. They're all there. The park has just opened. And Main Street USA is sort of that first spoke that opens up to all the hubs of the different lands in Disney World. So here's the spot where you're going to make your decision about what your family is going to do throughout the whole course of a day at Disney World. They're all there. Grandma's there, you know, babies in strollers, your spouse, your brother-in-law, your, 
your creepy Uncle Chuck who paid for the whole thing with his two billion Marriott points, that, they're all there. And we ask them, when you're in a situation like that and you begin to recognize that there isn't exactly a strategy or a plan, what would you do? And to a person, they all said the same thing. Well, if no one else was in charge, I would take a quick assessment of what everyone's needs are and then immediately start suggesting a plan so that we can all move forward. If no one else is the leader, I'll be the leader. <laughs> in fact, we talked to one woman and she said, I fully understand the nature of your question, but that would never happen in my family because when we're on the monorail, I would be handing out printed copies of our schedule to the day and everybody would be perfectly happy. They would love the fact that somebody's in charge and if no one else is in charge, I'll be in charge. Not because I'm a control freak, but I hate it when no one's in charge. So think about people who fit that kind of profile and how different it feels when you've got a problem and you're talking to somebody who fits that profile. These people we're calling controllers are wired to deliver a low effort experience. I'm not sure these would have been the kinds of people you'd want to hire five or 10 years ago, but the world is different. The job is different. The demands are different. It requires a different sense of sensibilities. So the obvious questions. How do I hire more controllers? And how do I teach my non-controller reps to do things that come naturally to controllers? What we've learned is that the average turnover in most call center operations is in the mid 20% range. 25, 28, 30%. Asterisk here, your results may vary. So you might have higher or lower turnover. But the point is, now that we understand that this profile is best at providing low effort service, what do I do with the people I already have, and how do I bring more people in who fit this profile? Let's start with what you could do with your non-controller reps. And really what we've learned is that you have to help your people sort of accelerate their traditional skills to act more like the things that controller people do much more naturally and instinctively. So instead of soft skills, which again is being warm and human and empathetic and repeating the customer's name three times and asking them how the weather is, instead of doing that, controllers naturally go right toward what we call experience engineering, which is literally engineering the experience of this interaction so that it feels like less effort. And we know that the way customers perceive effort is only one third do, two thirds feel. So taking an active position of engineering this interaction to be more low effort is what controllers naturally do. And at CEB, we've learned a lot of things that you could do to help even your non-controllers emulate these kinds of behaviors. Instead of first contact resolution, and again, there's nothing wrong with resolving customers' issues in the first contact, controllers naturally gravitate more toward a practice we call NIA. Has anybody heard of NIA in the past? Not first contact resolution, but next issue avoidance. Instead of saying at the end of an interaction, have I fully resolved your issue today, which we all know is really a horrible question, what they really should be saying is, and this is what controllers do naturally, hey, look, it might seem like this interaction is over, but here's one more thing that you might not be thinking about that we could either resolve right now or that will prevent some downstream problem from occurring. Resolving not just the issue you called in about, but even forward resolving your next potential issue. And think about how low effort that feels. <coughs> Traditional skills, and, and the thing that we say a lot that ends up being a very dangerous thing to say, consistent service. How could consistent service possibly be a bad thing? Well, consistent service sounds like treating everybody exactly the same and customers have different needs, different personalities. That's what the whole Mattersite platform is all about, being able to create a much more tailored service experience, which controllers tend to do at a much more natural rate. So again, so many things that we'd be happy to share with you, lots of other downstream research that we've done at CEB about all of these ideas, experience engineering, next issue avoidance, moving from consistently excellent service to consistently tailored service. So that are, those are some of the things that you could do with your present workforce to help them emulate more of these controller behaviors. But now what you really ought to be asking yourself is, how do I hire more of these kinds of people? 
Think about this right now. Maybe, literally happening right now, there's some group of candidates sitting nervously in the lobby of your corporate office, people who are just about to be interviewed for call center jobs. How would you know exactly who to pick? You know, we tend to pick people who are like the people we've hired traditionally over the years, and now we realize that is almost positioning people for that factory of sadness mentality because it's the wrong kinds of people for today's very different job. You can only hire from among those who are willing to apply, but have you ever thought about this? There are so many things you could do to attract and hire more controllers. Some of the smartest and most progressive companies in the world have done an amazing job of attracting new people to want to apply for frontline call center jobs. Let me ask you this question. Is working in a contact center a cool, fun, and sexy job? Yeah, it is for people who would think it's a cool, fun, and sexy job. And there are some people like that, and they tend to mostly be controllers who get an ego gratification out of guiding people to safety, out of being large and in charge. We said, sometimes they kind of act like a bit of a know-it-all. You know what know-it-alls like to know? They like to know it all, and they like to share that with other people. <laughs> it's a perfectly positive trait when you have a problem and you need to reach out to a company that you didn't want to do. You want to talk to somebody who's like, that's no problem. I've solved that problem a thousand times. Let me fix it for you right now. So attracting more people who fit this profile is critical. You know what's interesting? It sounds like in order to be successful with your new talent strategy, you'd have to be a lot more selective about who you, you hire. It turns out we've learned it's exactly the opposite of that. Really, bald man, how could that possibly be? Because it, it sounds like you'd have to be so much more selective. When we tend to think of selectivity, we tend to think of how many people we reject. Right? Like, we only hire one out of every 100 people who apply because we're very selective. But if you can take greater control, pun intended, of who even applies in the first place, then you can select a higher percentage of people who apply because you're trying to attract the right kinds of people in the first place and even deflect those who don't fit perfectly. Take a look at this. I know it's hard to read, but this comes right off of monster.com, and this is exactly the typical kind of job posting that we see companies around the world putting up on online job sites when they're trying to attract new contact center specialists. Candidates will possess proven customer service skills. Again, saying, we're gonna try to hire people who are a lot like the people we've always hired. Challenging career opportunities. Be an effective team player. Respond with timely and accurate information. Here's what we've learned, and if you do nothing else after today's discussion, I hope you will immediately look at what your company is putting up on various job boards trying to attract candidates for this critical position. Here's what we've learned. The vast majority of companies, when they do job postings, are actually doing job descriptions. And a job description and a job posting Ain't the same thing, not even close. A job description is a legal document that your HR department is required to create for every single position that you hire for at your company. And that's important, and it's critical, and you need to do that. You need to be able to justify exactly what each position is responsible for and how you've allocated your salary structure, and that's all about job fairness and all the other legal downstream issues that go into fair employment practices. So having job descriptions is critically important. A job posting ought to be more like marketing. A job posting is designed to attract the right kinds of people to want to join you, to want to be part of what you're all about. Posting a job description is like letting your lawyers take over the hiring process. You don't need that. You don't want that. You're looking to attract the right kinds of people, different kinds of people, the kinds of people who are perfect for the job as it exists in today's world. We've seen a number of companies that have done a really good job of attracting right fit 
candidates. This is a composite that comes from a number of companies, including Blue Ocean, which is a major Canadian company that hires people for hundreds of different call centers all around the world. We're hiring people who are dependable to their core and have the grit and tenacity to work hard even when the going gets tough. If you excel at planning long road trips, we bet you have the right stuff. There's that Disney World mentality. If you're the kind of person who within your family and social structure is almost always the organizer of stuff, that's who we want. If you're the person at the Little League game or the soccer game with a clipboard and a whistle, come join us. That's who we're looking for. This job isn't for the faint of heart. You won't always have the right answer, but if you're up to the challenge and you think, this is interesting, are you tough enough and sweet enough? In that order, apply now. We can't promise it will be easy. So you and your company need to take control over not just who you hire, but who you're even attracting in the first place. And at CEB, we've put together an entire hiring guide for helping you think through the decision-making process for how you want to describe this job. If you're describing this job as being punctual and following the rules and ticking off the QA checklist, all you're going to get are the same old people you've always gotten. But this is a cool and fun and sexy job for the right people. The trick is to attract more of them and then ultimately to hire them. Because controllers are wired to deliver a low effort experience. That doesn't mean every single person who fits that profile is always going to be the exactly right person for every single job that you have. But, you know, put it this way. If you were starting a basketball team, you'd probably want to find people who are really tall. If you're starting a football team, you'd probably want to find people who are really big and really fast. Don't you want to start with people who are best positioned to succeed in the job that you're going to ask them to do? Because it's the most important job at your company. Because your entire multi-million dollar service strategy comes down to two people, and you are neither one of those people. And you can't control this person, but you have complete control over who you hire, and even to some extent, who you attract in the first place. Let me leave you with this thought. Have you ever played this game before? Can you spot the difference? I'm going to show you two pictures, and I'll allow you to see if you spot any difference between these two pictures. On the left, here's a call center in the old world. This is what we call the factory worker environment, the factory of sadness, where it's all about coming in and reading a script and following the rules and doing the QA checklist and churning through the call queue and trying to create consistent service. That's the factory worker environment on the left. And on the right, this is today's ideal world, the knowledge worker environment, where we hire more controllers and we trust them to a greater extent. And we enable them to learn more from each other, not just from their training, but from their own experiences. And we allow our controllers to do the thing that they do best, own problems and solutions, take control over customers' problems. Can you spot the difference between these two photos? No, good, because they aren't. there aren't any. It's exactly the same photo, but the point is the difference between yesterday's world and today's world isn't how your people look, it's how you see them. And as part of your ascendant talent strategy, you need to see your people in a very different way. It's a different job, it's a different set of expectations, it's more complex, Customers are more challenging, and we need to bring in the right kinds of people to handle those challenges and to support them and position them for success. So I'll thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you.